So um, the, the bad news is that we're already behind schedule. The good news for those of you who have heard me talk before is that by the time I'm done, we won't be. Um, so, so I want to talk about substructural types, and I'm not really going to talk about them much to do with type classes, but it is going to sort of be about qualified types and sort of type classy like systems. So I figured I'd leave this title so those of you who don't like type classes need to just continue your coffee break. Um, but I want to start, up, start out by asking why would we care about substructural types at all? Why would we want substructural type systems? And for me, the short answer is because we want to be able to reason about state in our programming languages. Now, this is in a functional context. I'm a functional programmer. We all know the functional programs are fairly good about talking about state transformation. Um, you know, they want to transform state S and state S prime. We know how to do that. That's fine. But there are plenty of times where we might want to sort of mutate with the state. We might want to have some piece of state that's sort of not nicely transformed through the course of the program. And these are places where sort of traditional intuitionistic functional programming languages might have a bit of trouble. So here are some examples. Um, session types are sort of bizarrely popular at the moment. Uh, this is sort of a way to capture the proto communication protocol in a type. So, so you might have here, this is the, the send operation, we might have a channel, and this sort of captures the protocol of that channel. So we begin by expecting some sort of sending operation, or we send a value of type T, and then we're going to continue as S. And now we have a typo on this slide, because this S is really a T, it's just difficult to read. Um, so now we have a value of type T, we're going to sort of perform that send, that value on that channel, and the result is a channel whose type is S, the continuation here, right? Uh, for a simpler example, we might have sort of a type changing update operation. So we have some variety of references and we know what types are in those references, but we want to be able to stick values of new types into existing references. They look something like pointers. So here we can say, oh, we have a, a reference to T, and we want to stick a U into that, so we'll get back as a reference to U. Uh, a final example is sort of destructive array update, right? So, so we have some array, it might be rather large. What we want to do is to replace the nth element, this is a, or replace the, a particular element, so if n is the size of the array, this is an index less than n with a new value t, what we'd like to avoid do is doing is copying this entire array. Now in each of these cases, if we can copy the original arguments, we have sort of a type safety problem. So if we think about the session types example, if I have a channel that looks like this, it expects to sort of send a t in a continuous s, and I sort of copy that channel, now I have two copies of that channel, and now it would seem like I could use the send operation to send two different t's along that same channel. Right now think about my poor person on the other end of the channel, they expected to get one t, now they're getting two t's along the channel, and the safety's broken. Similarly, if I have sort of a couple of copies of this, this T ref here, I stick a U into one of these giving me a U ref back, but I could use one of these other T refs somewhere else to read the T out, right? So again, that's a type safety issue. And for arrays, it's not necessarily a type safety issue, but a matter of sort of referential transparency. If I can keep a couple of copies of an array around, maybe I mutate one of them. If I mutate it in place, I can observe that mutation and be down another copy of the array. So in each case, we have some sort of notion of state, whether it's sort of the channel state, the memory state, or, or the, the contents of this array. We want to be able to sort of work with that state, and so that, and so we're able to do that sort of better if we have some sort of, of control over any of these things. Um, so this is not a new observation. So I think it's it dates back to at least Phil Waller's paper, "Linear Types Can Change the World." Um, and in the time since that paper, which came out in 1992 or so, there have been lots of approaches to talking about substructural types in programming languages. And so it's reasonable to ask what I'm doing, sort of bringing it up again. But I want to tell you a little bit about each of those approaches and sort of why we might find them objectionable. So, so Phil's approach sort of is, is very nice and elegant and sort of amounts to sort of taking Girard's linear logic and moving it directly into a sort of propositions as type setting but in, a, in a functional calculus. Um, one downside of this is that sort of everything you have is sort of a traditional nonlinear object sort of has to be wrapped up in one of these modality flags, a sort of bang operator. And every time you want to work with those, there's a certain amount of syntactic overhead in the form of these sort of let bang operations to sort of put things into and get things out of these, these modalities. Uh, a later approach um, has to do with sort of introducing a generic, or, or generic, introducing a collection of sort of type modifiers. They're frequently called qualifiers. I'm going to use that word to mean something entirely different, so I'll call them modifiers. Uh, one example of this is Walker's chapter, Substructural Type Systems, and Pierce's Advanced Types and Burning Lines in the book. Um, what this sort of does is rather than having sort of a special bang modality for not unlimited things, it sort of says, well, in general, we can take any sort of pre-type, be that ints or bools or lists or what have you, and we can refer to linear or unlimited versions of that. Um, one consequence of this is that you get what I would call sort of unexpected or sort of perhaps uninhabitable types. So this is perfectly inhabitable. We can have linear booleans, but it's perhaps unexpected. On the other hand, this thing here where you say, oh, I have this channel, so for type safety reasons, I'd best not copy that channel, and now I'm going to apply this unlimited modifier to it. So what did I get out of that? I got out of the thing that's, the thing that's unsafe. I best not have any inhabitants of that. So we have a whole bunch of sort of uninhabited 
or otherwise confusing types. And finally, and this really is sort of the theme of this slide, but we have a sort of code multiplication issue, right? We might have, we have sort of two different sorts of functions. We have linear functions and limited functions. We might want to compose functions, but now it turns out we're going to need a whole bunch of different compose operators. One that composes two unlimited functions, one that composes two linear functions, one that composes a mixture of to the compose mixtures of them. That's a lot of compose functions, and we might sort of be displeased with writing that many copies of what's, at some level, the same function. Um, similarly, there have been sort of approaches that sort of treat these with sort of with a kinding mechanism or a subkinding mechanism. Um, so there's a paper by Maverick and all called Lightweight Linear Types in System F Pop. Um, <coughs> so it avoids the sort of unexpected issue by sort of giving you a static partition. You don't get to say for an arbitrary type whether it, you know, both get both a limited and an unlimited version of it. You say, Booleans are unlimited, channels are linear, and that's fine. You still have these code multiplication issues because you still, for example, get a proliferation of function types. And that's going to be most of the talk is talking about proliferation of function types. So I won't say any more about it right now, but to say you still do this code multiplication issue. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, my goal is to integrate substructural and unlimited types um, in roughly the way that Masaryk and, and et al. do, but avoiding the code multiplication issue. So what do I mean by that? Um, well, I mean, I'm going to partition my types. Well, I don't have any substructural booleans. I don't have any unlimited channels. Um, I want to avoid any sort of syntactic overhead. I don't want you to try to use let bags to take things out of modality boxes. And I, don't, and I want to avoid any sort of code multiplication. So I really don't want to have to write 16 compose functions. Almost like I knew I was going to say that, given its own bullet point. Um, and there is sort of a particular worldview that I haven't figured out how to write on a slide, but I'll sort of try to wave my hands out very briefly here, which is that um, I'm looking at this from sort of this, the, the question of sort of assuring type safety for things like these, these session type channels or these, uh, or, or type changing updates or something like that. So there'll be a bunch of times I'm actually sort of trying to say substructural instead of linear to make it clear that sort of that's what I'm interested in, I'm not necessarily interested in the other consequences of linear logic. Um, so I'm going to present you a language called SOL, that stands for uh, Substructural Overloaded Language, not shit out of luck. It's a functional substructural language. Um, it's based on the theory of qualified types. As a consequence, we get sort of principality and type inference roughly for free. Um, it sort of supports existing, existing functional idioms. That's sort of my way to say you don't need a bunch of composed functions. And I have a reduction rule that provably respect, respects the substructurality and sort of the type soundness, but that specific to substructural type systems. Um, I'm not actually going to talk a lot about these bullet points because I don't have an hour and a half. Um, I'll mostly tell you about the type system. So I've done this very cunning thing of coming to a type inference workshop and telling you about a type system instead. But with sort of the caveat that sort of the principality and type inference arguments are actually fairly standard once we have the type system set up. Um, there are three hurdles in terms of making this going. And I think they're all sort of in terms, especially if you look at how these sort of break existing approaches, they all come down to implicit overloading. Um, so the first thing and the obvious thing and the thing that people have in fact looked at before is the fact that you'd really like to be able to implicitly duplicate and discard things uh, of unlimited type without having to sort of manually write down, now duplicate this thing. The thing that people have tended to ignore is that there's also sort of an implicit overloading of application and abstraction. So I'll be talking about those shortly. So let's start out by talking about sort of duplication and discarding, right? So, so here's a function, right? We have twice x is, is x plus x. So it's the type of this function. Well, if we're sort of Haskell people, we might say, well, we'll do another type of x. We know that it has to be numeric, that is, it has to support plus. But coming at this from a substructural perspective, we would also do, well, we had to, we've copied this value x. So whatever this x thing is, it has to be unlimited. That is, it has to support duplication. Right? So, again, from sort of a Haskell perspective, we might say, oh, well, this thing looks like a type class. Can we treat this thing being unlimited as a type class as well? If we said, what does it mean for type to be unlimited as a type class, what would that mean? Well, so let's say t is unlimited type. Well, that means we can make it go away. So, so ignore momentarily these arrows. I will come back to talking about arrows for a long time. But sort of, we can make it go away. So we would apply drop to t, and we get back sort of a, a trivial to eliminate value. And I can copy it. So we apply dupe to t, and we get back two t's. Right? And so now, we can take this sort of twice function we wrote before and say, well, rather than just sort of using x twice, violating substructurality, we can sort of take x, call this a dupe thing on it, we get back y and z, and then we add y and z. And now what do we know about our types? Well, we know that this input type would best be numeric because we're going to add it, and we know that it would best be unlimited because we're going to duplicate it. Right? Okay. Uh, of course, we don't ever want to write this code. Right? This is a pain in the ass. What we really want to write is this. Right? Twice x is x plus x, but where we sort of infer this type that says, well, because we have used x twice, we best infer this unlimited constraint for it. Um, 
This is not entirely new. So there was a PhD thesis at Northeastern that resulted in a paper at Linearity 2014 in which a guy proposed sort of, sort of very much this approach. He doesn't propose the rest of the talk. So <clears throat> I'm going to try something that will probably fail miserably, which is I'm going to sort of continue, sort of at this point, start introducing the mechanism of the type system. Rather than having a bunch of motivation and then a bunch of typing rules, I'm going to sort of tangle up my motivation and my typing rules in the hopes that everybody will be lost by the time I'm done. So here's the system of qualified types. This is my sort of starting point in one slide. We have a language of types that includes some constants and functions. We have a language of predicates. The whole point of this system is originally proposed is that the language of predicates was sort of to be filled in by the user later, which I'll be doing on the next slide. We have some qualified types. We have some type schemes. We have some typing rules. And we have sort of an entailment rule, which I'm going to write like this for the predicates. Uh, so the typing rules are fairly standard. We have things like a variable rule and an application rule, which look about like you'd expect them to. And then we have some sort of rules to deal with these qualified things in particular. So this, this P is basically a, a context of assumptions on the type variables. And so if we have some predicate in that context, we can stick it into the type. And similarly, if our context is strong enough to prove some requirement of a type, we can get rid of that requirement. Right? So, so this is nothing, there's nothing new here. Uh, I'm going to be sort of talking about a substructural variant of that. So that changes the original a couple of ways. Um, we've got a couple of function types. We've also got a sum type. Um, Ask me about that afterwards. Um, we now know what our predicates look like. They look like these UNL constraints that I've sort of told you about already, or a couple more. And we now need to sort of take all these typing rules and make them substructural. So our variable rule before just sort of said, if any, if you can find this, this type x anywhere in gamma, then you can use it. Now I'm going to say, no, the context has to be sort of exactly this, this, this uh, binding of x to, to sigma. Similarly, when, so previously, so my application rule sort of copied this, this you know, uh, these assumptions gamma. Now I'm going to say, well, we have to partition the input assumptions h and h prime, such that half of them prove the, the typing of m, and the other half prove the typing of n. I've kept these rules up here just to say they don't change. The rules for substructurality are, are just, are, oops, sorry, little, 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 won't work. The rules for qualified types are just the same as they were before. So now let's look at this sort of starting point, which is to say, how do we type this? What are the rules that would allow us to type this without having to sort of manually write out this nonsense with dupe and drop? And the answer, they look something like this. So first of all, we want to be able to sort of, we want a sort of contraction rule. It says, it says that if, if our environment includes an assumption x have types, has type sigma, and we can prove that sigma is an unlimited thing, I'll tell you what this judgment, how the judgment works in a second, then we can sort of duplicate this assumption, right? So one thing that's sort of relevant here is that my, my typing environments are going to sort of be multi-sets. Similarly, if I have an assumption in the environment and I can prove that sigma is unlimited, then I can get rid of that assumption. I see some sort of conventional, um, contraction weakening rules from substructural logics simply poured over to my type system setting. Now, I've, I've written this. I sort of talked about an unlimited constraint, which we know something about type classes. We know that has to do with ground type, with sort of types, not type schemes. Um, but we can quite straightforwardly lift this sort of judgment that we, that we know about for, for sort of types to qualified types and to type schemes just by a matter of sort of pushing, pushing predicates around the return style. So it's all quite, sort of, quite straightforward. Okay. What time am I done? 10 minutes. OK. Well, I'm not going to finish this then. Let's talk about functions. So the basic question I want to ask here is, what does it mean for a function to be unlimited? And here's where sort of this system is, is meaningfully distinct from just sort of saying linear and being done with it. Um, there are a couple of ways we could talk about what linear implication means and correspondingly how you express an intuitionistic impl in, in, implication in a substructural system. right? What I'm going to say is sort of, let's look at this from a sort of operational perspective. I have something that transforms T's to use, but I know that this thing, I'm in a, a sort of typical functional language, I know that this thing could have captured a bunch of values as well, right? So it's got some sort of closure. And now the question is, what does it mean to copy this TDU transformer? Well, I can't just copy the code. I assume I can copy code. That's, that's potentially easy. But it also means I have to copy the closure, right? And so if copy, so it's only safe for me to copy this function thing if it's safe for me to copy the closure. As an example, suppose I had something that captured a channel in its, in, in its, in its, in its closure, right? So now I have something that goes from ints to units, but somewhere in the closure is an int dot end channel, right? Now, if I copy that closure, so ints seem perfectly copyable, units seem perfectly copyable, but in the process of copying this, this, this function, I've also copied the channel in its closure, and that seemed like a bad thing, right? The real problem is that whether you can do that isn't observable from the arguments of the function. Right? My function might take an int and it might give me back a unit, and that doesn't tell me anything at all about what it's closed over. So I really do need to sort of distinguish between functions that haven't closed over anything linear, which I'm going to write this way, and functions which have closed over something linear, which I'm going to write that way. 
right? I might change all my arrows at some point in the future so they don't look like anything anyone's familiar with, but unlimited, linear, right? And now all of my problems will emerge. So let's consider a very, very simple function. This is even simpler than, than compose. This is sort of the application function, right? So we take an f, we take an x, and we apply f to x, and you can do this in sort of most of the systems I've talked about. And in most of the systems that I've talked about, you sort of discover that you don't know what the type of app is. It either takes an unlimited function and an argument and gives you the result, or it takes a linear function and its argument and gives the result. And there's no way to sort of unify these into one sort of generic option that describes both of these sorts of types. Right? So we're sort of stuck. We have to have two versions of app, one for each of these types. Right? The basic problem here is that I wrote f applied to x without telling you what f was. It says I have two sorts of functions. If I'm going to apply things, I have to give you some sort of clue about what I don't like. So, Garrett, presumably you could even have linear errors on the second argument. Could. Sure. Four options. Uh, yeah, I'll come back to that one. Um, there are at least two options. We'll put it that way. Um, so, so, if you know something about me, you know that my answer, I'm sort of like a small boy with a hammer, and my hammer is called type classes. So, I seem to have two different things that have sort of similar sort of operations on them. What if I say, what if I introduce a type class to abstract over those things? You don't really want to do this either, but it sort of allows you to motivate, sort of allows me to hopefully to motivate what's going on. So I can say, well, I have a class of function-y sorts of things, and function-y sorts of things are things that have this apply operator. And now I'm going to say that my, my two sorts of arrows are function-y sorts of things, and, and to see my language saying, let's say that I don't have any other sorts of function things. And now I can use that to sort of give a, a, a more, uh, an overloaded version of the apply rule. It says, well, if my, if, if my, my argument type, my function m, has some type, phi, applied to tau and u, such that phi happens to be a function-y thing, and the argument has the right type tau, then this result has type u. So it sort of introduced overloading of functions. Right? And again, sort of my rules for proving functioniness are that they apply to the sort of two types that I have. Right? Okay. Um, and so this, allow, this sort of solves my first problem, which is to say now I can say this app thing takes, you know, for some squiggly arrow t to u, a t, and gives you back a u, and that's fine. But there's another problem that Sam was sort of pointing out in there. I sort of started writing app curried, right? And you can say, why did I do that? Well, the answer is if I do it, if I uncurry it, then there's even more options, right? So here's the uncurried version of app. And so now we have these three options. We can either take a, an unlimited function to an unlimited function, a limited function to a limited function, or we have this sort of additional option of taking an unlimited, uh, an unlimited function to a linear function. Right? If it's safe for me to copy it, it's perfectly safe for me to not copy it as well. Right? And so I've already talked about how we can use this sort of squiggly arrow to abstract away the argument type. Right? So we could sort of say, well, these three, I could all say, oh, that's a squiggly arrow. That hasn't really helped me with, with this column. Right? This is still too restrictive to, to include that type. Right? The result's still too limited. Uh, sorry. So, so you might say, well, geez, I have this sort of squiggly thing around. Can I use it to solve my problem? And the answer is partially. So I know that this result is also a squiggly arrow. So I could say, well, suppose I call this first squiggly arrow f. It, can I say, well, this takes a t to u squiggly arrow to another t to u squiggly arrow, where it's the same squiggly arrow. So I'll write f in both of those cases. Right? And I want to sort of briefly point out, this, looks, this type looks conspicuously like the identity type. Uh, but this argument, this term isn't quite the identity term, right? It's really something that looks like that. What's important to note here, this squiggly arrow corresponds to, to this abstraction here. Right? What we're saying is the linearity here, whether this thing is a linear or unlimited function, depends on the linearity of this thing, which is typing this f here. So the linearity of this closure here depends on this thing it's closed over there. Right? And this still isn't quite good enough. Right? This gives us <clears throat> ah, this version, those are the same. This version, those are the same. It hasn't given us this version in the middle yet. But now maybe we can see the way that we could get to that <clears throat> version. And that's to say, we don't want to say these are exactly the same arrow, but we want to say there's some relationship between them. Perhaps like this. So what we're going to say now is, well, this takes some function, t to u, which we call f, and gives us back a function t to u of type g, where f is has more structural rules on it than g, right? And that's what this sort of, this basically is, is, is considering the, the number of structural rules that we can apply to a given type, right? So unlimited types are greater than linear types. 
Right? Now, here these things are both functions. They need not be functions. Let's consider sort of the church encoding of pairs. This is the thing that breaks in sort of most of these existing systems, but works nicely here. So we're going to take a T, we're going to take a U, and we're going to return sort of a pair of T and U. And well, it's not church encoding of pairs, it's just a curried pair construct, excuse me. And now the point is, this closure here depends on the linearity of T. If the first thing that we the first argument we pass to P is a, is a channel, let's say, then the returned closure had best be linear. On the other hand, if this is, let's say, a Boolean, then the return closure can be copied perfectly well. So here we say, well, this is some function, looks like f, is so long as t is greater than f. OK? Um, now let's see the rest of the talk. Uh, that apparently my clicker has gotten upset with my skipping slides. But that's OK. I can skip slides anyway. Um, well, I'll tell you about this. Here's sort of the principality result. Uh, sort of says if we have sort of two typings of the same expression, uh, then there's some additional typing, some additional type sigma that's more general than both of them. And now, I'll tell you a little bit about sort of where I think this goes from here. Um, so I've shown you a system that sort of has these, these lambdas and sort of overloads application abstraction. And I claim that sort of what this gives you is a system which you can sort of write compose once. Right. In particular, it's a system where if you write, take any, and I would say Haskell with air quotes around it, but any sort of, of simple overload, any, any program sort of simple overload language that types in the non-substructural version, it types in this version as well. The type may not quite be the same, because it may have a bunch of unlimited constraints hanging about it. But sort of all the existing Haskell programs sort of type perfectly well in the system as well. So you sort of have the, it's a sort of conservative extension of existing Haskell languages that sort of additionally allows us to talk about channels. Or, 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 array, or, or mutual references or these sorts of things. Um, there are lots of other, reason, other ways you might want to sort of have other sorts of substructural systems you might want to have. So for example, affine type systems are kind of popular. This sort of says, well, it's fine if I throw things away, but I don't want to have more than one copy of them. Right? These systems all fit very nicely into this framework. I, simply, I have more function types. That's fine. So now I have sort of affine arrows in addition to all these other arrows. That means I have to extend my notion of greater than so that it sort of takes account of this larger ordering. But everything else stays the same. In particular, my operations don't sort of continue to multiply. Um, there are lots of systems that sort of look like linearity but are sort of a little more expressive. And I think it'd be interesting to look at some of those particular issues, such as fractional permissions. So I have a linear reference to something. And as long as it's linear, I can keep updating it. At some point, I might want to start sharing it. Right? It's fairly really easy to coerce a linear reference into an unlimited reference that you can no longer update or no longer change the type of when it's updated. But you might then want to be able to coalesce those back into the original reference that you can then sort of have a full set of operations on. There are various approaches to that. Fractional permissions is one. The problem I have is I haven't worked out exactly what to do with the arrows. I think it would work. Um, yeah. And I'll stop there rather abruptly when I have to pass my slide. sorts of reasons that people might care about linearity in programming languages. One is we have sort of safety guarantees that we're going to use linearity to assure, and that's what we get with like session types. The other is to say we have sort of optimizations or something that we might only be able to apply um, if we know that something is used linearly. So in some sense, my array example, or if you look at GHC, they have this sort of usage analysis, which has to figure out how much of a closure they need to build. And so in both of those cases, you can sort of see a way to sort of nicely degrade in the case where you don't know that something's used linearly, right? So I can always copy an array if I have to, but if I know that it's used linearly, maybe I can do a destructive update. I can build a full closure if I have to, but I know that if it's only used once, I don't have to do that. Um, so I think these are sort of two views of the same problem, or sort of two, two reasons to care about the same thing. I've taken sort of a very safety-oriented version where I'm sort of concerned about session types and such not. Um, my suspicion is that you could apply this approach to the other case as well. Um, so for example, you could sort of say, well, I'm sort of assuming that all functions work the same. You could say, well, the linear functions actually are a little bit different. They don't build closures. And the system would still allow you to sort of infer where you can have linear, linear um, arrows, and thus where you can avoid building closures. So I think a lot of those cases would fit into the system. But um, I certainly haven't tried to show that it's equally expressive or that it finds all the same things that you can find in the clean uniqueness types. <coughs> 